Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education for the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. I want to welcome everyone to our talk today. Um, before we get started with today's legacy lecture, I want to mention some upcoming programs. Obviously, March is not only the um, marks the anniversary of the Girl Scouts, March 12th, which will be 111 years old, but it's also Women's History Month. And as uh, the National First Ladies Library here every month, every day is Women's History Month. So we have a number of programs this month to mark all of the activities as well as things to mark our upcoming exhibition. So we are transitioning at uh, First Ladies National Historic Site from our winter to our summer hours, believe it or not, summer and spring are right around the corner. So May 1st um, will mark the end of our winter hours and we will be opening a new exhibition called Beyond Camelot featuring objects and artifacts related to First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. We're very excited. We have a number of programs and activities. The um, exhibition includes a collection that has been donated to us by Monty Durham of Say Yes to the Dress Atlanta. And he will be here to kick off the festivities live and in person. And we have a number of programs. Um, leading up and throughout the year to celebrate not only Jacqueline Kennedy, but to celebrate the legacy of Anne Lowe, um, the designer of Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress. So we're very excited about that. Um, and next month for our legacy lecture, we will have a speaker, um, William Kump, who will speak on Jackie's autobiography and books. So one special aspect of this exhibition is that it includes um, all aspects of the First Lady and her life, including her life after the White House. So she will, um, we will be covering in this talk her um, experience as an editor. So besides that program, our regular film series, our um, talk with the curator will feature an uh, exhibition curator of of an exhibition about Frankie Welch, a fashion designer. Um, we have Cooking with the First Ladies, our book club program coming up, um, and a Fun with Flotus children's program, March 30th, related to the Girl Scouts as well. So we're super excited about that. And again, I'll drop the Eventbrite um, site into our uh, chat here. So if you have questions for our speaker, you can use the chat. If you want to tell us where you're tuning in from, we will definitely be sending out a link to um, the program. If you can't stay around today, you want to share it with someone. Um, and if you, again, again, if you have questions, if you have technical issues, please hit me up in the chat and I'm happy to help you out. Um, our speaker today, Ann Robertson, is a volunteer historian for the Girl Scouts Council of the National, of the nation's capital and founder of Girl Scout History Project blog and digital museum. She earned a PhD in political science from George Washington University and edited the journal Problems of Post-Communism for nearly two decades. She is a lifetime member of the Girl Scouts and earned the gold award and the thanks badge. So I'm going to turn things over to Anne and um, welcome Anne. Thank you. Are we getting here now? Okay. So what we want to talk about today is the longstanding relationship that the Girl Scouts have had with the White House and with the First Family. Before we get too far into it, I should mention that, as Allison said, I'm a volunteer. I'm not an employee. And the views expressed here are my own, not necessarily those of the Girl Scouts of the USA or the Girl Scout Council of the nation's capital. The relationship between the Girl Scouts and the White House starts around 1917 is when an official connection was made designating the first lady of the land as the honorary national president of the Girl Scouts. It was a sly move by our founder, Julia Gordon Lowe. 
1917, the organization was only five years old and we were getting a bit of a reputation as maybe being um, a little bit wild, uh, a little bit on the edge, more interested in basketball and hiking than maybe staying home and cooking and cleaning. So the link to the first family and to the White House gave the Girl Scouts an enormous amount of publicity and respectability. In the White House, the First Lady's office soon discovered that we could be very helpful to them, especially in terms of extending their own platform. But truth be told, before the official ties were made in 1917, the first family did work with the Girl Scouts. Here we have um, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who was part of the very early uh, war bond sales that the Girl Scouts began around 1914 and 1915. The Girl Scout National Office was briefly in Washington, D.C. from 1913 to 1916. So another benefit from linking to the White House would be to help keep a presence in the nation's capital. Our first First Lady as National President here was Edith Wilson. She accepted in 1917 and was very active and interested in the Girl Scouts. But truth be told, just being accepted and her agreeing to be First Lady didn't automatically bring publicity to the Girl Scouts. And it didn't automatically bring an invitation to participate in Wilson's inaugural parade. We had over 400 Girl Scouts from Washington, DC and the Baltimore area that petitioned the inaugural committee and the National Park Service to be able to march in the 1917 parade. Now, parade officials, the men, were skeptical that these dainty little girls would have the fortitude to survive the entire march, all the way from the Capitol to around where the Lincoln Memorial is now. So they had to drill before a select group of military officials on the ellipse and prove that they had the ability to do it. As it turned out, excuse me, as it turned out, it tur the inaugural parade took place on a very dismal, rainy, dreary day. All of the roads had been covered in sand because it had rained the day before and no one was gonna have traction without the sand. So the girls waited and waited and waited for their opportunity, shivering because they didn't wear coats. They wanted everyone to be able to see their brand new, nice crisp khaki uniforms. So as they were waiting around for three hours to start, their leaders fed them chocolate bars and bought newspapers for them to, to keep warm. The girls took the newspapers and stuffed them under their blouses and into their bloomers to try and have an extra layer to keep them warm. When they finally got started the, and made the, the walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, the wind was whipping so hard that some of them said it looked like they had chicken pox by the time they were done. They had so many dings and marks from flying sand. Always, always on the look for good publicity, Julia Gordon Lowe made sure to, to get maximum publicity that she could from the new relationship with Edith Wilson. Edith's predecessor, Ellen Wilson, had actually turned down the invitation to be with the Girl Scouts. So one way to really raise the visibility of this was immediately to award Edith Wilson the thanks badge, the highest award available to Girl Scouting. It, this was done at the National Convention in Philadelphia in 1917. And not only was publicity high and called in to make sure they were aware of it, but they made an extra special thanks badge for her. Um, I have a thanks badge and mine certainly is not encrusted with diamonds and rubies, but this one definitely got people's attention and attracted information and questions about what exactly the relationship was. Um, Mrs. Wilson returned it to the Girl Scouts um, in the mid 1950s and it's now on display with um, the Juliet Gordon Lowe birthplace in Savannah. One of the things that Mrs. Wilson liked to do was to invite local Girl Scouts into the White House for special events, particularly courts of awards, where girls were uh, presented with badges they'd earned, particular medals and such. Uh, this particular um, session was at the White House uh, to present this girl here in the middle, um, uh, Ruth Coleman with the highest award then available, the Golden Eagle of Merit. And you can see all of the rows and rows and rows of badges, oops, of badges running up and down her sleeve. 
this girl up here now at this particular event just got her first class badge. She was just learning to be Girl Scouts and starting, excuse me, and starting on her work towards the highest awards. Her name's Minnie Hill. And Minnie stayed in the Girl Scouts for the next couple of years and wound up selling over $900 in war bonds and treasury bonds um, in 1917 and 1918. And she was brought back to the White House where a medal was presented to her to mark this. Um, Minnie's uniform actually is part of our collection here at Nation's Capital. It's, uh, you, you can see it there on the left. And down is a close up of uh, the participation pin she got for her troop working on the, the bond sales. And then the medal that she won is one of the highest sellers in the country. Florence Harding came in uh, as part of uh, this initial group of first ladies, certainly had not had a chance to be Girl Scouts when they were young. Uh, most of them didn't have daughters that had been old enough uh, and timed correctly to be Girl Scouts, but they were interested. These early days of Girl Scouting you know, here in Washington, we were really hot stuff. We were really popular in many respects and people liked having us around. Uh, we would be invited for honor guards and parades and to just stand around and look wholesome, uh, believe it or not. But Florence first met up with the Girl Scouts uh, when she was preparing to come down to Washington DC uh, for her husband's inauguration. And she really wished that she had been able to be a Girl Scout at the time and told that to, to as many people as she could. She met these girls um, at her hotel at the Waldorf Astoria as she was coming together with her, um, her wardrobe that she would need for the, for the inauguration. But she made the public statement along with this photo that I would be perfectly delighted if during my sojourn in the White House, the Girl Scouts would come down there. Well, they did. Lots and lots and lots of them did and showing up unannounced, completely unannounced, which resulted in the Girl Scouts having to make a statement to make all appointments now through the national office. Uh, this is a problem that I have seen all the way through up until current times uh, that any, it is surprising how many organizations and how many troops and Girl Scout councils uh, uh, want to invite the First Lady to one of their events. So there's been this constant effort to at least channel them through the national office so they can be thinned out and not become part of the 10,000 pieces of mail that First Ladies often receive every week. Still though, Mrs. Harding was very interested and accommodating to as much as she could. Um, there was a group of girls that came down uh, one time and surprised Mrs. Mrs. Harding. So she invited them in. She opened the doors, conducted them through the upper floors of the, of the White House and even allowed them to see her bedroom. At that time, the Girl Scouts were emphasizing thrift because it was uh, the twenties and they were completely delighted when they noticed that uh, the bedspread on President Harding's bed had been darned several times. Long before, we sold cookies. The local Girl Scouts did fundraisers that used other baking commodities, other baked goods that were popular. The very first thing they did here was to open a tea house um, down on Haynes Point in Washington. That's where the two rivers meet. Uh, first year, it was just um, an old rail car that had been converted, but local Girl Scouts operated it and serving various delicacies, sandwiches, sodas, and such. And it became extremely popular and a quite lucrative fundraiser. And the Hardings were particularly interested in this. They loved to go out and take Sunday drives and they would stop in and uh, see what was going on at the tea house. Uh, newspapers would report things. Uh, President and Ms. Harding paid an unannounced visit yesterday to the Girl Scout tea room. At a little green table under the tree, they each sipped a bottle of pop through a straw while hundreds of motorists passed without recognizing them. They may not have been recognized on that particular day, but others, they certainly were. Um, the Girl Scouts were very excited to have the opportunity to serve the president. And one of the girls, one time, she noticed that Mr. Harding had not finished all of the cake he was eating. So she scooped it up and put it in a glass jar. Glass jar. And she wanted to label it and remember it as the cake the president didn't eat. 
The other girls now refuse to believe that she had this cake. So to prove it, she brought it to a troop meeting one time. On that occasion, there happened to be present a small four-year-old boy at the meeting. And when they went to show off the cake, they discovered it was missing. In fact, the little boy had eaten all of it. And he looked up and declared, I eated the president's cake. No, no information about what happened to him and what the troop did after that. So the Willow Point here, tea house here, um, that was the rail car was so popular that the US government wanted to um, upgrade it and make it a nicer facility. And you can see here, um, the building was upgraded, um, large, white, very open area, uh, public restrooms were offered. Um, and the Girl Scouts again continued on, on weekends to provide cakes and pies and, and drinks of various kinds. Um, there was a little bit of controversy that arose at one point because the Girl Scouts were selling cigarettes um, and they had to make a, some decisions on that so that the leaders were the only ones who could actually sell cigarettes. Um, the tea this tea house only lasted into the mid 20s when the Girl Scouts moved on to other things such as selling cookies, but the building stayed for a long time. Um, well into the 1970s as uh, it was converted into a visitor center at one point. So popular that the Girl Scouts opened a second tea house in Washington, D.C. And again, these were local Girl Scouts, the Washington, um, the Washington Council who were working at it. Um, there is an old mill, Pierce Mill, that is in Rock Creek Park that still stands, and it was converted into a tea house as well. It was said to have a decor of blue and yellow and gingham, uh, curtains on the walls and uh, small vases of flowers on it. It was officially open for the very first time and dedicated by Mrs. Harding and was regularly used on weekends for special events. Mrs. Harding came a few times. Um, her successor, Grace Coolidge, particularly liked it. And it was also used as a place for meetings for adults uh, from the Washington area. But what proved to be apparently the most popular um, event uh, menu item that was added here was Harding waffles, as you can see. Um, the, the recipe was even made public and was available through the newspaper if any organizations wanted to have it. Um, President Harding died unexpectedly um, in 1923, but one of his last functions was also food related, um, and that was to dedicate um, a little house. What happened was there was a movement in the United States at the time called the Better Homes Movement, uh, which was to bring science and technology and new products um, to the awareness of the American housewife so that they could have um, a nicer home, more nutritious foods, build stronger bodies and such. Um, so in June of 1923, uh, this Greater Federation of Women's Clubs, who were working with this Better Homes campaign, arranged for a model house to be erected on the National Mall on Sherman Square, sort of behind the White House. Um, it was to be open for about a week for people to pass through, be amazed, see all of the products, all of which were tagged with the manufacturer's name because they had all been provided at no cost for that. Um, this week, there was a quick little piece in the Washington Post about a Shriners convention and an enormous parade that took place in Washington, also in June of 1923. And this building exhibit was actually timed to that. They were thinking that 500,000 or something Shriners were coming to Washington, D.C., so their, their wives certainly would need something to do. And it did prove to be extremely popular with 3,000 people a day passing through this. After the exhibition was up though, the question becomes, what do we do this? This is an actual home. It was three bedrooms. It had a fully stocked kitchen, bath, um, grand piano, baby grand piano was donated for it. And the solution was to see, maybe the Girl Scouts would like it. Lou Henry Hoover at the time was national elected president of the Girl Scouts. She was not in the White House yet as first lady, but her interest in, in the Girl Scouts goes back to the very beginning. And she thought, this is something that maybe the Girl Scouts could use. Um, and she actually said, you know, this is going to um, shore up our those criticisms of us as not being good housekeepers. This is a great opportunity. We can't pass it up. The problem was the house was offered, not 
uh, any funds to keep up with it. Um, so that had to be uh, argued back and forth for quite some time. It took about nine months before finally it was agreed that the little house would be accepted by the Girl Scouts. Here's a postcard that was on it and a map. Um, the yellow square is across New York Avenue, 1750 Newark Avenue, uh, which is where the little house uh, was moved to. And you can see how convenient it was to the White House. This made an extremely strong opportunity for the for first ladies to pop in as needed um, to see what was going on. You can see here, um, Mrs. Hoover personally paid for the moving costs and to have it set up here on New York Avenue. And Grace Coolidge, by now who was first lady, um, came and made the official dedication. I think everyone doing cement work should, and trowel work should have uh, you know, a fur collar jacket when they're, when they're coming. But Mrs. Coolidge enjoyed Girl Scouts immensely, very much got into the idea of it. Just quickly, um, see you can see what was offered here at the girls at the little house. Um, it was intended to be sort of a laboratory. They said um, somewhere between a girl's dollhouse and her first home as a married woman, so she could come in and practice and hone her skills at various housekeeping activities. And if you notice, a lot of these are being observed. Here is a cooking demonstration, canning demonstration with Lou Henry Hoover there. Sewing also has Lou Henry Hoover. Um, I love the pictures of them in the basement with the, with the laundry. Um, I don't know if that would be particularly exciting to girls these days, but there actually was a laundry badge at one time. So we had this opportunity right near the White House and the availability and the proximity was a tremendous factor in deepening the bonds between the White House and the Girl Scouts. As I said, Grace Coolidge really got into the Girl Scouts. She really, really liked her uniform. And she went um, to the um, she went to the trouble of going through uh, the ranks. And uh, she earned her Tenderfoot badge, for example, um, which meant that she had could say the Girl Scout promise and law. She could tie a certain number of knots and she could draw a picture and explain the design of the US flag. Um, like Edith Wilson, uh, Mrs. Coolidge enjoyed participating in the various award ceremonies that went on, uh, particularly when she was getting the award. Um, here on the left, we see Julia Gordon Lowe pinning her with her tenderfoot badge. And then later that day at the same court of awards, um, the president, the honorary president of the Girl Scouts, Mrs. Coolidge, was presenting various trophies, awards, and badges to the various girls. She really, really liked being a Girl Scout. Her husband was not quite as enthralled with the Girl Scouts. Um, the group here on the left was a group from Prince George's County, Maryland, that was asked to go to the White House to meet with him uh, to mark the, I think it was the 21st birthday of the Girl Scouts. And they brought with him, they brought with them um, jam for, um, for the president to enjoy. And he was very reluctant to, to accept the jam. And he was reluctant to speak to the girls. And it was extremely reluctant to take a photo with them. But nevertheless, he got possessed. Um, on the right, you can see him arriving with his wife at the little house. Um, this was for a special Thanksgiving dinner cooked by the Girl Scouts as a demonstration. And again, you he doesn't look happy to be there. I think this is something his wife must have really twisted his arm to, to get him to agree to it. Um, more with Grace Coolidge. She was involved um, inspecting troops, looking at drills and rallies that they have. Uh, the, the picture up on the, on the top right is uh, dinner at the little house. Um, she would go to any uh, particular ceremony or event or demonstration at the little house and at times she would just drop by unannounced. Um, there was one Saturday where she showed up unannounced. The girls were frantically thinking, well, what can we do to entertain her? What can we demonstrate? And one girl had just had a piano recital uh, and had her piece memorized. So she sat down at the grand piano and, and played for Mrs. Coolidge. Um, at the bottom, Mrs. Coolidge 
uh, is accepting uh, one of the first Girl Scout cookies. Uh, at this point, they were still made by troops themselves. And according to newspaper accounts, she was actually given a five pound bag of Girl Scout cookies, uh, which is not something that we, uh, not a size that we offer anymore, definitely. Grace Coolidge realized the, the value of having the Girl Scouts around. And she began inviting them to be honor guards and escorts for various events. Um, she would request them to come. If she was you know, planting a tree in a playground, she would ask if the Girl Scouts could be there. And a group was always provided. It might've only been eight or nine girls, but in full uniform, uh, they were an impressive group to have around. In 1925, Grace had the idea of inviting the Girl Scouts to be child wranglers at the annual White House Easter egg hunt. And this became a tradition that has lasted almost a century uh, with that collaboration. Uh, we have the, the girls come, they play games with the kids, um, keep them entertained. It's usually the Girl Scouts are put in charge of the lost kid uh, area uh, that is set aside for them. Many troops um, who participated, um, many, excuse me, primarily local Washington area troops were invited to participate um, in, in uh, the egg rolling ceremonies. And we've got memories that a couple of them have, um, have written. Um, one girls remember coming in to meet, being able to meet and to pet um, Mrs. Coolidge's pet raccoon that you can see here. Um, she would take girls into the White House garden and for example, she had a, a troop that was um, had the red rose as their emblem, and she would go into the garden and cut red roses uh, from the White House garden and present them to each of the girls. Uh, one girl that we know about is a little chubby faced girl here, um, uh, Elizabeth. Um, she um, greatly se seemed to greatly enjoy her time at the at the White House and created her own scrapbook. Um, with pictures and other mementos from the day. Um, she stayed here in Washington, uh, grew up, became a doctor, uh, graduated from George Washington U University Medical School. Um, she never had children and passed away maybe 10, 15 years ago. And out of the blue one day, I got a call from an, an estate attorney who said, we have this, this, um, this woman's scrapbook with the Girl Scouts like it. And my favorite part of it uh, when I went through the scrapbook was this little scrap of paper, little uh, brown paper with the, the first lady's autograph on it and carefully folded and put into Elizabeth's pocket as a keepsake. Um, certainly a nice memory that she took away from the day. After Grace Coolidge, uh, the Hoovers were elected into the White House. As I said, Lou Henry Hoover had already been a national president, elected actual president of the Girl Scouts, and she would serve more terms that in that capacity once she left the White House, which makes her unique. Um, she's also one of the most important people in um, the early days of scouting and the development of the movement across the countries. She had been living in Washington before she came to the White House because her husband was Secretary of Commerce. And she had taken over a troop in 1923 when its leader was injured and then moved out of the area. So first Troop 8 would meet at the Hoover's house in Georgetown. And when they went to the White House, meetings continued to be there in the White House. Um, but you know, paperwork is everything. And just because you're first lady of the country doesn't mean you can shirk on your paperwork. Uh, I love this postcard of uh, the Girl Scouts reminding her that she needs to turn in her paperwork. Lou was also beneficial greatly to the local Girl Scouts. Um, nation's capital op opened its flagship camp, Camp Mayflather out in, the, in, the, out in Virginia um, in 1930. Lou was very interested in the development of it. She made uh, a personal donation to build a camp, to build, excuse me, to build a bridge across the river that ran through the camp. And she actually came for the dedication and spent one night um, in a tent there, had meals with the girls, 
Um, and then there was a ceremony where she uh, walked across the bridge and cut a ribbon of, uh, I think they said mountain laurel, laurel um, leaves and flowers to completely inaugurate the bridge. Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, was very interested in the Girl Scouts and every other group. And she fortunately kept that interest going, um, stepping very well into um, Lou's shoes um, as far as supporters of it. Um, this idea of the, the Better Homes Week of America continued to be an event for, for years and years. And uh, Eleanor almost every year would uh, kick off the event kick off the week, excuse me, with an event held at the Little House. Um, she would use the Little House as well and the images, the pictures of her to promote various causes, in, particularly, in particular thrift. Um, in 1933, which I believe is this, this photo here, um, the Girl Scouts kicked off the Better Homes Week by creating a luncheon that cost $15 per person. And the entire menu would be published in the paper as an example of how to, how to stretch your, your budget uh, during the Great Depression. Um, when girls were having various uh, badge proficiency tests done, um, there would be demonstration days. And um, here we can see um, Eleanor inspecting a group uh, working on their cooking badge. And it was said that she was so taken with the girls that when she had time, she might ask, she might pop over to the little house uh, here to pick up a, a basket of hot rolls to take back to serve in the White House. Right. Again, when you're in the White House, as long as Eleanor was, uh, you had multiple opportunities to do things with the Girl Scouts. Uh, here she's planting a tree at the little house. Uh, meeting with a brownie, um, and that's the original brownie uniform, which is absolutely adorable. But some of the other things that she arranged uh, were a little more um, unusual. Uh, there was one year that um, a group of Girl Scouts did an inspection tour of the White House to make sure it was up to standards. They had to go through and make sure there were things like fireplace screens in place and uh, Protect, protection on uh, faucets and other, you know, rugs, rugs uh, secured so you wouldn't slip, um, which was an interesting idea. She continued to be uh, pleased with the Girl Scouts and was a great promoter of them, um, often mentioning various projects that were going on in her um, newspaper column, My Day. Now, Bess Truman, certainly coming in after Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, had very, very big shoes to follow. She was very shy personally. And at the same time that she came in, in 1945, um, the Girl Scouts closed the little house. So she didn't have an excuse to go back and forth. Um, she didn't, it wasn't so easy to have carolers coming back and forth from the Girl Scouts uh, to, to perform at the White House at Christmas. But still she was a, as, active and as supportive of the Girl Scouts as any other organization uh, that she could. She enjoyed kicking off the cookie sales, um, promoting various programs of thrift or international friendship that the Girl Scouts had. Mimi Eisenhower was not a Girl Scout herself. She didn't have daughters, but her two nieces were Girl Scouts. Um, and she enjoyed working with the girls and welcoming them to the White House for various events. Uh, she particularly liked this little girl who had her own version of bangs, and I think they discussed who had the better and more easy to care for set of bangs. Um, the Eisenhower family was involved whenever possible. Uh, the girls shown at, at Wright um, kicking off the cookie sales uh, are actually her nieces who are active Girl Scouts in Washington. And on the left, you can see uh, the president there as well. Um, of course, the Eisenhowers left the White House and lived in a, a home near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And apparently that was a fairly well-known fact. And I've seen many reports or plans of troops saying, well, we're gonna drive to Washington and we're gonna stop at the Eisenhower's house, the farmhouse, because we know where it is and we're going by and hopefully they'll be home. Um, and this seemed to occur um, more often than you would not. I don't know if eventually um, some sort of warning from the, from, uh, 
the national organization until people would stop dropping in unannounced on the Eisenhowers. Uh, but uh, Mimi continued to always be a very good sport about it. Mamie also had plenty of help from her, the second lady, uh, Pat Nixon, to help out as needed with the uh, Girl Scout programs and Girl Scout interests. Uh, Mrs. Nixon's daughters were both not only Girl Scouts, but she was their assistant leader. So she came in um, already with a fondness and a affection for the Girl Scouts and a knowledge of their programs. Um, and here we have the two first ladies there with a wonderful portrait of Lou Henry Hoover. Kennedy's, well, Jackie Kennedy, unfortunately, um, was not very active with the Girl Scouts. Of course, um, she was there a limited number of years, um, had various babies and various health concerns, and just simply did not have time. Um, her social secretary informed the Girl Scouts that Mrs. Kennedy, yes, would indeed accept the offer of being honorary national president, but there would be no photos of it. Uh, Letitia Baldridge said, Mrs. Kennedy, she's, she's not the uniform type. And she also, when she would make commitments, a few commitments to the Girl Scouts often um, would pull out at the very last minute, leaving her husband to, to pinch hit. Uh, here we have um, a national vice president and a local Girl Scout bringing a doll for Carolyn and a bouquet of yellow roses for the first lady. Um, he promised uh, definitely to pass them on and at some point, um, special editions of the Brownie Handbook and a special Brownie uh, bookmark were sent to the White House for Carolyn, um, who of course was too young to be a Brownie while she was in the White House. But just as Mrs. Nixon um, helped out with Mrs. Eisenhower's duty as First Lady, uh, Lady Bird Johnson also stepped in. Um, in 1962 was the golden anniversary of the Girl Scouts uh, which was a celebration um, held largely in Washington, including a large um, large festival birthday luncheon um, at the Capitol. Both of Mrs. Johnson's daughters were Girl Scouts. Uh, that's two of them here in the picture on the left. I believe that's the cake for the 62nd, uh, 1962 birthday celebration. But she was also just interested in the Girl Scouts and the various programs they did. Um, she would regularly, um, encourage girls to come, um, for outstanding girls to come to the White House, for troops to come. If she had time, she would meet with them. Uh, this was a particular um, event in what, 1968 that she participated in, 60, um, yeah, 68, um, where um, maybe 20 or so girls were brought to the White House to mark a special service project that each had designed and carried out. And they said it was an hour long um, event where uh, Mrs. Johnson would be introduced to a girl and she was briefed and ready to go. Knew what the projects the various girls had done and was ready to talk and interact with them and made the girls feel very, very special that the first lady knew all about them. These, uh, I don't think it come together quite as nice as I would like to, <laughs> to be able to see them. Um, both are, are letters from Lady Bird uh, to the Girl Scouts that she added her own uh, comments to. I like here both Linda and Lu oops, both Linda and Lucy were Girl Scouts, and I feel it was a happy and constructive part of their life. When you're looking through um, information on the First Ladies, a lot of what you have to consider is symbolism. Uh, how often they worked with the Girl Scouts, how visible they were, how how many pictures and statements and such that came with them. And interestingly, um, in was it 1964, uh, Lady Bird made a uh, whistle stop tour of the Eastern United States over four days. It was four days and almost 2000 miles. Um, one stop was in Savannah, Georgia, birthplace of the Girl Scouts. And she specifically asked for that. Um, the, um, her message that was made at the Savannah train station is, is available on YouTube and lasts about five minutes. This was an extremely tightly scheduled uh, tour to cover that much ground in that, that amount of time. But she insisted that while she was in Savannah, she wanted to see the Juliet Gordon Lowe birthplace. Um, and she had arranged for a 10 minute trip 
that she enjoyed so much that she spent uh, twice the time there um, and managed to throw much of, the, of her whistle stop tour off schedule because she wanted to be with the Girl Scouts. Mrs. Nixon, as I said, was very interested in the Girl Scouts because she herself had been a leader and her daughters had been very involved. And unusually unusual, she is still the only Girl Scout honorary president who actually went to the Girl Scout National Headquarters to be invested to receive her pin. And that was done with February 1969. Um, the pinning ceremony is there on the right. And she was able to meet with a considerable number of girls who were present when she came, uh, when she came. Um, this event, uh, I've seen the scheduling for this event and it was amazing. I don't think D-Day had as much advanced planning as it. In order to make that day go perfectly, every second uh, was completely scheduled. And my favorite little uh, tidbit was uh, the Girl Scouts even requested an elevator repairman from Otis Elevator to be present at all times, just in case the elevators went out while Mrs. Nixon was there. Uh, Mrs. Nixon out of the White House continued to be very active and a big supporter of the Girl Scouts at the Nixon Center in California. Um, there was an exhibit done a few years after her death called The Spirit of Volunteerism um, that really focused on her time and her interest with the Girl Scouts. Her daughter was also extremely involved with the Girl Scouts while her parents were in the office, were in office. Her husband, of course, was serving in the Navy at the time, um, and she continued to live in the White House. She, as much as possible, would be willing to meet with various groups in town. Um, the picture on the right is a reception from a particular girl event that brought 120, I think, girls from across the country, um, senior girls, high school girls, to an event called uh, Petticoats, po Petticoats, Politics, and Pot. Um, one of the, uh, it was a current events session that went on for about two weeks with girls debating various policy positions. And at the Girl Scouts, at the end of it, one decision was that uh, marijuana should be decriminalized instead of legalized. It would be just reduced to a misdemeanor. And they came to the White House uh, presenting their ideas and she said that she agreed with them on decriminalization of marijuana. Up at top, up at the top there, very colorful, is a cruel embroidery kit that um, Julie designed herself. Um, it was sold as a kit, especially through um, the Family Circle magazine. Um, she earned $83,000 in royalties from this embroidery kit and used it to establish the um, Julie Eisenhower Fund with the Girl Scouts that was used for special projects, um, small grants, maybe $5,000 and such to a council to help um, to help reach out and recruit leaders and girls from um, underserved communities within their area. And pro the program went on for about a decade. It was extremely popular and it's extremely, I think, unknown uh, that this uh, special fundraiser for the Girl Scouts um, even existed. Betty Ford also was very interested in the Girl Scouts, but she also very much a case of not in the office, not in the White House very long. Um, she did happen to be in the White House uh, at the time of the 1975 Girl Scout National Convention and welcomed girls um, to the, an opening ceremony, which was held on the White House grounds and on the ellipse. Um, she met with a group of older girls that presented her a quilt uh, pat with a pattern related to the state of Michigan. Um, and she also was the point person for uh, celebrations done by the Girl Scouts for the, na the nation's bicentennial. Um, there was a whole series of projects um, that a bound copy was presented to her showing what every council planned to do for the events. And she also was involved in this Flames of Freedom ceremony where um, she lit a ceremony candle that was supposed to be picked up um, with similar candle lighting ceremonies um, to follow all across the country. Mrs. Carter came in, also very familiar with the Girl Scouts, uh, not long before they arrived in the, in the White House. Um, the Girl Scouts of uh, the United States raised enough funds of a bust of Julia Gordon Lowe put into the Georgia State House. 
And as governor and first lady of Georgia, the Carters were, were quite present. Um, one thing um, that is not uh, advertised very much is, um, or known these days, is that the Carters enrolled their daughter, Amy, in the local public schools, and they enrolled her in a local brownie troop. Uh, where she was quite active and, and it seemed to enjoy the experience very much. Um, Mrs. Carter also happened to be around at a very fortunate time um, when a brand new Girl Scout curriculum was introduced with a heavy emphasis on career development. And um, also new uniforms were launched. Uh, um, you can see what the, the teen uniforms look like on the left and imagine a room full of that green uh, that vibrant greens. I chose uh, here black and white large photo to protect your eyes from it. Nancy Reagan also did what she could. Uh, she was very fortunate in being in Washington when we had several uh, national major celebrations for the 70 and 75th anniversary of Girl Scouting that she took part in. She also um, worked with the Girl Scouts um, on her signature platform of um, drug abuse and, and drug intervention. Um, even the, there was a curriculum that was developed between the White House and the Girl Scouts with a special patch that girls could um, earn about uh, learning about um, drug addiction. We'll just flip on through here quickly. Similar things happened for the next few years with similar first ladies. Very em large emphasis on events that were national celebrations, such as the 80th anniversary uh, attended by the first lady. Um, and um, she also kicked off various uh, national service projects here uh, for the 80th birthday. It was one on um, um, ecology. Her national platform personally was on literacy. And there was a reading initiative and a reading badge program that she kicked off and introduced when she actually attended uh, one of the national conventions um, in 1990. Mrs. Clinton, a Girl Scout herself, and in fact, she was a Mariner Girl Scout apparently. Um, worked with the Girl Scouts, same traditional roles, many um, photo calls and um, opportunities to, to pair up on similar causes such as um, um, smoking, anti-smoking programs. Um, while we haven't had uh, a female for president yet, we do that now with, with Mrs. Clinton, every female secretary of state has been a former Girl Scout. And she developed um, the first Girl Scout Day at the State Department when she moved over there, um, an event that continued for quite a few years and helped expose many girls to various ideas of foreign service. Her daughter also had been a Brownie um, before they came to Washington, and she has continued to work with the Girl Scouts. This is a, a picture of her uh, working at the 2017 um, National Convention, she was extremely popular, extremely gracious, and a very nice role model for the girls. Laura Bush has done uh, many, has um, I guess repeated many of the proven tactics before. Uh, like her mother-in-law, she promoted uh, literacy whenever she could. And her daughters, both of the twins, have been active in uh, taking those local speaking engagements to councils and such that um, our first lady herself doesn't have time for, but um, it's been a nice tradition to try and make that work as much as possible. Michelle Obama was not a Girl Scout, but she came in with two young girls. And oh, did we hope that they would become Girl Scouts. Uh, even though her daughters didn't sign up, she was a tremendous asset to the Girl Scouts, largely because she realized that her own platform of nutritious eating and healthy exercise um, aligned very much with the Girl Scouts. And she made sure to have Girl Scouts participate in any event that she was involved in. And many of them, President Obama uh, came as well. Um, the girls would come through special tours and, and be very impressed um, that they were able to meet the first couple. Um, since leaving the White House, um, Michelle has worked on creating um, this um, Becoming Myself project that was especially popular well, that was released during uh, the COVID pandemic, where girls have a curriculum and a, sort of a journal to try and um, define their own goals and their own values and such. And that's uh, a very unusual and, and popular way of her staying involved um, after she left the White House. But Michelle, uh, you, you can't top this. 
Uh, it was in June 2015, the very first camping trip uh, sleepover at the White House. I think it was 50 girls, most of them who were actually from my neighborhood. It was a huge last minute project um, calling in um, local girls, local troops that were available. Um, they actually it wound up being rained out and everybody went into the basement of the old executive office building for the, for the night. Finally, I don't know what the future is as far as Girl Scouts and the White House. Um, if the scamping trip is going to be the, the last event, it's certainly a memorable one. Um, Mrs. Trump came uh, in 19, excuse me, uh, came into office in 2017. And what I understand was feelers were points out, would you be interested in being Girl Scout honorary president? And she was, no, not really. So um, sort of to avoid a very awkward and embarrassing situation, no invitation, formal invitation was ever submitted. And that brings us to our current first lady. Um, and best I can tell, um, I've reached out to try and verify this with um, TSUSA, um, Dr. Biden has not been asked to be uh, our first, our um, honorary national president. Um, I certainly personally think she's qualified. She's been an advocate for girls. She's a former Girl Scout herself. And as second lady, she was a regular um, spokesman and um, vocal supporter of the Girl Scouts. What next? I don't know. Um, back here um, in, uh, excuse me, November 1958, a Girl Scout magazine ran its first article about, you know, when are we going to have a, a woman in the White House? And we're still waiting for that, but I like to think whenever it happens, it's going to be a former Girl Scout. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was a wonderful talk. It was so great to see all of those different images of first ladies throughout time interacting with the Girl Scouts. And we did have a few questions in our chat. Um, I wondered if you could speak about Juliet Gordon Lowe. If she had any personal relationships and friendships with the first ladies? She did, um, particularly um, her, Juliet was, of course, um, wealthy family, uh, upper class. Um, she went through the whole finishing school route and she had um, a large circle of wealthy female friends. And her um, approach was to go into a new town, ask her sort of co-finishing school friends um, if they would set up a council there. Um, and certainly those private connections and private ties especially with Lou Henry Hoover, uh, were used to help advance the cause and to raise publicity. Can you, the question came up in the chat when you were sharing the Lady Bird special image about segregation and the Girl Scouts. Did First Ladies have any role in helping to desegregate the Girl Scouts? I think probably the, the best example there was Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, in, in establishing Girl Scout troops and councils across the country, um, the idea was to always have it available to all, all girls, although integrated troops were not always established in various places. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt attended a, one of the Girl Scout conventions and was photographed um, shaking hands with um, a black girl in uniform, um, which was publicized quite widely. And I uh, think some, uh, some, some communities in the South were upset by it, but um, since 1929, the policy has been, has been to make um, Girl Scouting available to all girls, period. Uh, doesn't matter race, economics, um, religion, um, so Eleanor Roosevelt definitely by making a public statement or public demonstration of the diversity of Girl Scouting, yes. You showed a really great picture, I believe, of Bess Truman surrounded by Girl Scouts who had made or were selling cookies. And I wondered if you could talk about just the history of, of you talked a little bit about the tea house and the activities, but like the cookie sales and um, what that has been and if uh, First Ladies have played any role in it further. 
Lou Henry Hoover was um, a big supporter of using the national cookie sales as a fundraiser um, and especially in pushing it towards um, mass production by professional bakeries. I mean, there was a time when it was baked in your mother's kitchen, all of your Girl Scout cookies. But one of the regular duties of a first lady has always been um, to uh, kick off cookie season, be photographed um, with, uh, with, with uh, young girls and, and order of blanks. Um, the Reagans in particular, um, the national cookie champion selling thousands and thousands of boxes was from the Washington area. And they invited her to the White House for several events. But that's, I think that's one of the required things if you're going to be honorary president is to support Girl Scout cookies. I wonder if you can speak about, it seems like Michelle Obama did have some influence when becoming, um, came out on Girl Scout curriculum and, and thinking about first ladies, especially Lou Hoover, who was such an outdoors person, interested in camping, interested in so many activities that we might associate with scouts. If first ladies have had a great influence on like badges or curriculum, related to scouting? I don't think um, there's been much emphasis or much influence on the actual topic. Um, mm -hmm. in the role of, of Washington and the federal government more broadly has been important with um, uh, various government departments perhaps being uh, working with particular badges and such. Uh, it used to be uh, local Girl Scouts for a while. I mean, this was very early 20s and 30s. Uh, for example, if you were er earning your bird badge, you had to go down to the Smithsonian Museum's curator of birds. And the test was to identify like 10 birds in his office. <laughs> so it's been more of an indirect influence, I guess, on badge work. Thank you. Um, so, and last question, where can people sure. find you to follow, continue to follow the research that you do on the Girl Scouting? Um, my blog is gshistory.com. Um, and I've recently published um, my second book on the history of Girl Scouts, um, which is called Rescue Rockwood. It's about a Girl Scout camp that was on the outside of Washington. Um, and very often, girls from across the country who are coming to their nation's capital to understand the government used it as an affordable place to stay. And it's, I know Amazon has it. Awesome. So we can look for you on the blog and definitely check out the book. Um, thank you so much, Anne. This has been a wonderful talk. We've had lots of great feedback in the chat and we look forward to celebrating the 111th birthday of the Girl Scouts. Thank you. I've had a good time too. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great day.